Good evening. My name is Lewis Powell. It's, it's my pleasure to come before you once again on behalf of the Cook County Bar Association. And we have a marvelous guest. Thank you. F former Arlene, Col uh, former president of the Cook County Bar Association, Arlene Coleman, who actually, we practiced law maybe 20 years ago. I forgot about Long that. Long time Long time. Ago, I actually yes. forgot about that. Yes. No, I didn't forget about it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we were formerly associated with the law firm of Jones, Ware, and Gernard. Gernard. And it was referred to back in the day as the firm. Yes. In my recollection, you know, God bless uh, Mr. Ware. Uh, Jones Ware and Gennard actually was the largest African American firm in the city of Chicago for quite a while. For quite a while, yes. and actually, I believe Attorney Coleman the second largest in the nation. I, a, I think that's correct. With a good book of business. Yes. But that is then. This is now. Attorney Coleman did a marvelous job as the uh, president of the Cook County Bar Association. People are still talking about the tremendous year you had. I'm sure you're a little bit worn out, but I hope that you recover, you know, sufficiently and, and your practice is back on track. Ladies and gentlemen, we, today we're going to be talking about a very key area of probate. Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, you know, everybody got an estate. Right. Okay, maybe small and maybe large. But technically, everybody have an estate, and what estate is, what you leave after you go home to be with the Lord. That is correct. And we, we, you know, Arlene and myself, we could talk together all day, but it wouldn't be no fun, if that's grammatically correct, if our audience did not interact with us. The yes. phone number is 312-738-1060. Let me repeat that. 312-738-1060. To the extent, uh, please call us. To the extent that Arlene can ask, answer questions, she would do so. And we're going to get this ball rolling. We want to give you a bang for your buck. Okay. Thank you, Lou, for that wonderful, uh, Attorney Powell, for that wonderful and excellent introduction. That's what happens when you go back, way back with a person. You, It's it's a friendly relationship. Even if we're adversaries, we're still a absolutely. professional friends. Um, I, I do want to talk about uh, the probate probate and ad, advanced directives, which is okay. a small slither aspect of uh, probate. Now, for those of you in our in our audience who don't know, probate is the legal process governing the administration of one's estate after their death. We all know we're not going to live forever, and in the course of your life, you accumulate things. Some people accumulate a lot, some accumulate a little. But either way, those things are part of your estate. Typically, the probate process begins, involves admitting one's will into probate, if they have a will, opening the estate, appointing the named executor uh, as the administrator of the estate. But we find that in many cases, the deceased person may not have prepared a will evidencing their final wishes of what is to happen with their assets. Attorney Coleman, yes. can I stop you for a second? You sure can. We, we, want to get, we want to make it plain and simple. Okay. So let me ask you a couple of basic questions. Let's go. Okay. Now, let's talk about the will. What is a valid will in the state of Illinois? Well, a valid will is a will that states what your wishes are, but what makes the will valid is the attestation clause of the will and by law the statutes that govern the, the probate act that governs this area there has to be an attestation by two that's a an attestation is an a statement a positive statement that you the testator the person making the will are of sound mind and memory and that you're in your right mind you know what you're doing uh, two witnesses have to attest to that and the way they attest to it is that they sign after you sign the will. So you sign. They don't have to read your will. They don't have to know what you said. But they have to say, we know this person. They're in their right mind when they're doing this, and this is what they want to do. Uh, a lot of times we do notarize wills, but the law does not require notarization. It requires that two witnesses attest to it. Be uh, the thought is that because if your will is challenged later on, those witnesses may have to very well come in and say, yes, uh, uh, Sister Coleman or uh, Attorney Powell were in their right mind when they made those statements. You might not like what they said, but they were in their right mind when they did it. Uh, the other thing that um, I'd like to say about uh, wills in general 
is that you as the testator, you know, have to indicate uh, who you are and typically how many children you have, if you have children or if you're married, what your marital status is. In the will, you make bequests to people that you've identified that you want to receive things. I want this person to get my red purse or that person to get my fur coat or my car or whatever. Um, also, you can make financial uh, bequests as well to individuals. The estate planning process is one that you need an attorney to do it. Because uh, those of us that practice in this area are experts in the law. We know what is required to make the will valid and also to put it together in a way that is foolproof or it should be foolproof. Um, so does that kind of answer your question? You know, Derek, I'm, I want to stay with the will just for a second. Okay. Okay, we talked about the assertion, which is basically two witnesses. Again, right. they don't necessarily have to know that, this, that they're witnessing the will, but they have to know that you have signed the will. You know what, I did want to add, uh, Attorney Powell, that the person who witnesses the will should not be the person who you're leaving things to. That was my next question. That's a great question, um, and, and I've had scenarios where that happened because this, this raises a suspicion that, well, you're benefiting from the will, so you would, it would be in your best interest to say, yes, uh, mom or dad were in their right mind, mm -hmm. or sister or brother, when they made that will. So you want to get people that are not beneficiaries under the will. Although they can be, that's not the preference, and that's certainly not what I recommend. I prefer independent wit witnesses. Next question. Who's in charge? Because we hear these terms, independent administrator, yes. executor. Could you explain that for us? I can. In your will, you name a person that you want to be in charge. You pick the person. And, and this is the, the beauty of the will. It gives you an opportunity to decide, make these choices yourself. Uh, so it's, it's not left up to speculation or guesswork. You've said, I want this person to be the administrator or the executor. The executor can be one of the heirs, one of your children, but it can also be a totally uh, uh, uninterested person, a friend, uh, uh, another relative, someone, but it should be, I recommend that it should be someone that you trust, someone that you believe will follow your wishes, and uh, regardless to any opposition that may come against them, that they're going to say, no, this is what this, your loved one wanted, and this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to get an attorney, we're going to probate this will, and we're moving forward with it. And sometimes that takes a strong, a strong person. But is there a distinction between an independent administrator or it's, executor? Is that, I'm mean, using okay. the right term? Yeah, you know what I was going to get to that. Uh, what I was saying is in cases where you, so when you prepare the will, the person who is in charge is an executor. Uh, you name an executor, and you should also name a successor in executor in the event that the your first choice is unable to serve or something happens to them, they may predecease you and you don't have a chance to change the will. So if you have a successor, then the second person would be in charge. I've seen wills where they had a couple of successors, so you, we just went down the line till we got to the person that wanted to do it. Independent uh, administrators come up in situations where there is no will. When a person does not have a will, you still have an estate. You still have assets or things that have to be dealt with after your death. Uh, in that instance, a, um, an heir, a friend, a family member, and sometimes even a creditor can petition the court to open your estate and seek to have an, an administrator appointed. That administrator can be an independent administrator. An independent administrator can work freely without the court's direct supervision. Or it can be a supervised administrator. With supervised administration on a decedent's estate, everything that that administrator does has to be court approved. So, uh, again, you know, sometimes we have... Uh, Situations where there may be concern that someone is abusing their power. That's a lot of work, counsel. That's that, a lot of work. Because, you know, if, if every every move has to be approved, I guess, to not to run up a bill, you really have to really, I guess, when you go before the judge, I'm asking for the audience's sake, to really have everything lined up that you propose, <laughs> propose to do. Yes, well... Excuse me. In situations where I work with families and there's some 
mistrust or a little disagreement about things, I try to explain to them, and even the court will try to explain that if, not to discourage, but just to let people know, if we move to a supervised administration, it is going to increase the cost because the lawyer has to continue to come to court. But before we go down that, that's a slippery slope sometimes. So I, I really wanted to mention a couple of things about advanced okay. directives. Because for some people, I find that the, the thought of creating a will or a trust, and that's another form of estate planning, is overwhelming. And so what I find is happening is that people aren't making any plans. So there are a couple of estate planning tools which I believe every person should have. And I think that it's not difficult to have. And I want to say to the audience, just because you make a will doesn't mean you're going to die. It doesn't. It, I've not seen that happen. But when people are sick and in the hospital or facing life or death issues, that's not the time that you want to have to plan what happens with your stuff. I, I think you want to focus on getting Attorney well. Attorney Coleman, I, I believe we have a call. Okay, let's take call. Caller, are you there? Caller, are you there? Hello? Yes, go ahead with your question, please. Hi, my question is, um, my mom, um, her uncle, um, he, um, he's been deceased many years, but um, the thing is, um, he had a sister who had an estate um, because she was, um, you know, taking care of his property, a, a house owner, but the thing is, he disowned her for personal reasons, and um, how do you go about um, finding out where he was buried? Because the um, location of the law firm that handled his estate um, went out of business many, many years ago. So it's like finding the needle in a haystack because the, the lawyers refused to give um, his sister at the time any um, indications where he was buried at because he was in the military. And um, it's like a hopeless situation. Well, you know, in that instance, so your your his sister or his aunt is she's deceased. Pardon? She's deceased as well. So who's trying to locate him now? Well, my mom's trying to find out where exactly where he's buried. You know, I I think that if you believe he's buried in Cook County, uh, there are only there are a limited number of uh, funeral homes. I mean cemeteries, and that. Mm -hmm. All of them keep a registry of who is buried there. So you could just kind of get a list of the cemeteries in the area and then call and just ask, is that person buried there? That's well, we tried that, but I mean, they weren't even, he's not even located in none of the cemeteries out here in Cook County at all. And the thing is, my mom don't have his social security number, his date of birth, none of, the, none of that information, only his first and last name. Yeah, I don't know if that would help you find him either. Is there anyone in the family that has the uh, an obituary? Well, see, the thing at the time is my my grandmother's aunt actually had like a newspaper clipping about the law firm, and I guess it was published in the um the Chicago Tribune or something. But the thing is, my mom don't recall what year it was. Okay, that's going to be difficult. Like you said, it's a needle in a haystack. And I don't know that the law firm would necessarily, after so much time, uh, because we are, we're not required to keep these records forever, uh, that they would even know where a person is buried unless they had the obituary, which is something that I ask, and most probate attorneys ask the family to bring in. But... Um, yeah, I, I think that you've you've got a difficult situation there. I'm sorry, I don't I don't think I can help you. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Call. Attorney, All right. Let's try to pick up where we're at. We're still at the will. At if the will's properly executed. Yes. What is the next step? Do you have to file the will with, with anybody? The will should be filed with the clerk of if it's a death in Cook County. It's, uh, the law requires that the will be filed with the clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County, that's the Honorable Dorothy Brown's office at the Daily Center, within 30 days of the person's death. The original will should be filed. Once it is filed with the clerk of the court, then it, it becomes a public document, that, uh, but it's also preserved or protected mm -hmm. so that no one can come in and modify it or destroy it. So it's very important that uh, if 
the that the person's will is uh, collected and placed uh, with the clerk's office. Sometimes that will may be in a safety deposit box, and uh, safety uh, the banking industry will allow access to a box once you bring in a death certificate to see if the will is there. Um, the other thing that I recommend for testators, the person, the person making the will, make sure that your the person you've named as your executor has a copy of your will. That will help or knows where your will is so that they can access it. That's very important. I've had many cases where uh, clients have told me, well, they had a will, but we can't find it. And so there's a presumption in the law that if a will cannot be found, it is that the testator destroyed it. That it is, it, so the will will not govern what happens. And, you know, that was the other thing I just want to make sure that it's clear about wills. If you do not make uh, provisions in a will, then the court, the law, the Probate Act, will dictate how your assets are dispersed to your heirs. And in that instance, sometimes people are uh, will receive a benefit that you may not have wanted them to receive. How so? Well, uh, the 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 policy of the rule is uh, of law is descent and distribution. So when a person dies without a will, under the law, half of their estate would go to their spouse if they have a spouse, and the other half would go to their children if they have children. If they don't have a spouse, then the estate passes to their children. If they don't have any descendants, then we go up to their parents, if their parents are alive. And if parents are deceased, then we, we're we seeing cousins, um, third, uh, second and third cousins sometimes, receiving the benefit from a deceased person that they may not have ever met or known. What about uh, children that have passed away? What if they have children? If the children, if... If the if the testator's child pass, but they have grandchildren, those grandchildren can inherit their parents' share. They can. Okay. Yeah. So just you know, I know we're on a limited time, so I do want to just get to a, touch upon a couple right of ahead. things. You know, th we could like you said, we could talk about this stuff all day, and I think I I do plan to come back and maybe focus on another subject. But today, I wanted to talk about the advanced dir directives. I believe that everyone should have a, a power of attorney. The Illinois Legislature. Uh, found that it was in the public interest to create standardized forms for powers of attorney, authorizing agents to act for them in dealing with health care, property, and finances. These forms are available online. Uh, while I recommend that you have an attorney assist you, it is not required. They are user-friendly. Uh, but there's language in there that you may not understand. Uh, so with the health care power of attorney, this in this in this instance, you are authorizing uh, a person to act as your agent to make decisions on your behalf under certain circumstances. The triggering event may be that that you are no longer mentally capable. You might be unconscious, and someone has to make a decision whether or not to have a medical procedure. If you have a health care power of attorney in place and you've given it to your doctor or you've given it to the person that has the authority, they can present that document and then they can uh, follow through on whatever your wishes may have been. Well, she wanted this type of surgery or she didn't want this type of surgery. And it, it just kind of cuts down on a lot of confusion and drama, uh, which you don't want going on around at the time uh, at the time that you're dealing with a health challenge. The other thing is uh, a power of attorney for property. And, uh, gee, I'm running out of time. Uh, the transfer on death instrument is also an advanced directive that was newly created. Uh, you can go to the Recorder of Deed website and look at forms, click forms, and that will lead you to the transfer on death instrument, which is an instrument that you can prepare and sign now, record it, and and when you are, if you're the owner of real estate, this only applies to real estate in Cook County. If you're the owner of real estate, when you pass, you've already got a document on file that says who's to get that property, 
again, cuts down on a lot of confusion. The last thing that I wanted to really touch upon, and this is very important to me, is some general information about retaining attorneys. Um, our bar offers a referral service and uh, for lawyers, you can call the Cook County Bar Association at... 312-630-1157. Uh, that is correct. You can also visit our website at www.cookcountybar.org. Click Lawyer Referral Program. Uh, and it will give you a list of attorneys and their areas of practice. Now, I'm uh, in addition to getting a referral, so I always say it's better if you can get a referral, maybe from someone you know who has a, who has had a successful experience with an attorney. You want to get an experienced attorney, uh, and and there are different ways that attorneys gain experience. I meant we mentor and support other attorneys who uh, I've been practicing thirty years. Lou, probably twenty six. All right. Um, so I, I tell people, you should check. You don't go to the first lawyer that approaches you or you approach. Check with other attorneys. It's, there's no charge for a phone call. And uh, if a lawyer, you know, doesn't call you back after a certain amount of time, that's a, that's a clue that that may not be the lawyer you want. You may also visit. All attorneys are in Illinois are registered with the Attorneys Registration and Disciplinary Commission. Their website is www.iardc.org. That's iardc.org. You can click Lawyer Search and for any lawyer that you're thinking about hiring and their information will pop up. So you want to make sure that that lawyer is a registered, licensed attorney. Some people are not, and it's against the law to practice without being licensed to do so in Illinois. You want to check to see if there have been past complaints filed against that attorney. To, and that information is available to the public. Uh, you want to we, we'll see, can we squeeze in one more call? Okay, just make sure the lawyer has malpractice insurance. And just be smart about it. Ask questions. Let's take that caller. Caller, are you there? Caller, are you there? Yes, I am. We got about two minutes. Make your question quick, please. The question is, I currently have a will that was prepared over 10 years ago, but I understand I need to add a codicil as certain things have changed with respect to distributions and amounts. And your question? Um, how how simple is a codicil? I mean, how basic can I make it? Um, it depends on how many changes you have. So if it, there are a lot of changes, I will recommend just uh, voiding that will and writing another one. Uh, but it, it, again, depends on what provisions of your will have changed. Um, the attorney that prepared the original will for you, you said it's 10 years old. Is that attorney still available? We well, got one minute. We've got one minute, and we have to wrap up. If you, if you, you can go to a new attorney and have them review the will, and then they'll let you know if it's more uh, practical to uh, do a new will or to just do a codicil to amend your will. Thank you for your call. Very good. You got last say so, Madam President. Well, I think that um, I, I just want to encourage people to uh, not be afraid to do some estate planning. It is important. And if you don't make decisions about what happens with your property, your assets, your investments, then someone else outside of you, outside of your family, will make those decisions. And uh, it's better, I think, for the loved ones you leave behind to not have to make decisions regarding how to disperse your estate. Attorney Coleman, you've been a marvelous guest. Sorry we ran a little bit out of time. Thank you. But as, as a former president of the Cook County Bar, I'm sure we'll have you back. And you just keep doing what you're doing. And may God bless you. We'll be back again same time next week. Thank you.